You're listening to This Week in America with Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody, coast to coast. This Week in America, great to have you with us on the program today. Once again, talking about the Legacy Series written by Robert Maxim, one of our favorite and most popular guests back to share his incredible journey through several lifetimes as far back as a million years. His blunders, triumphs, many worlds and places where these amazing experiences took place. As you remember, as a child, Robert experienced several sleep time visits to other worlds, witnessed countless alien craft. Well, these experiences continue to date in both wake and sleep states. He studied concert piano beginning at age three, but changed his calling to science following his visionary experiences. The book, Legacy Series, the culmination of these experiences, shared with the world for the first time. Robert spent 40 years studying science, religion, and the science of life, presented by Dr. Ernest L. Norman. Validating sightings that started in 1962 and expanded into visions July 13, 1973. He proceeded to con- confirm his experiences with other established sources, such as George Adamski and brothers from other worlds who helped instruct him over the years in person and mentally. The book series is the culmination of such visionary and confirmation efforts written in novel form. It's the Legacy Series. And back with us on the program, all that being said, Robert Maxim. It is great to have you with us, Robert. Welcome back. Thank you for having me on your show, Rick. It is such an amazing story, and I always feel like I need to do background for those that uh, are joining us for the first time and, and listening to Robert. We've done a number of programs, dozens of programs available. If you go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and you can uh, go to the archives, the video and the audio, and listen to past programs. And I'll give you Robert's website information shortly, and you can get information there as well. What we're attempting to do, an expanded version of the show today, is get through some of the questions we've, we've had from listeners that, uh, that are backed up because we've had so many questions and so many great answers. And by the way, if you do have a question for Robert, all you need to do is go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and submit your question. Robert, are you ready to begin? Let's go. All right. Question number one. We are taught in the Bible of historical events. Did they happen as portrayed? Uh, uh, how many hours do we have in the show to explain <laughs> See, that's, that? <laughs> that's what I meant, and that's why we get behind here, because there's so many answers, oh. great answers to, to all these questions that we're that's talking a, about. That's a great question. It deserves a long answer, but the, let's yes. see what I do. <laughs> there's so much to say there, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, on, a, on a topic like this, the more you say, the more in trouble you can get. <laughs> yeah, choose your words carefully. Uh, it, <laughs> well, you know, to some, um, what I'm about to share might seem uh, somewhat stunning and surprising, but please know that uh, from the heart, I mean the highest possible respect to all sorts of beliefs, personal choices, and the whole things, God. Now, that said, I think it's vital that we confirm scripture sources uh, first and foremost uh, the purpose for publishing and creating the source in the first place uh, the languages and traditions of the times it's important to know that uh, and never never take someone's word or approval as legitimate in spite of their credentials uh, if I can say without sounding a little bit uh, on the wild side that (laughs) I don't like fake news. (laughs) Good, thank you. (laughs) Um, So that's why I'm very careful with what I read, what I accept. Uh, I have to have confirmation. I have to go to the source. So that said, uh, I can say that there are definitely errors in translation and several mythological burdens that make some of these biblical accounts that we're all familiar with and creeds unreliable. Um, now, the, pr- the proof of that is found when you compare the translated text, say, from uh, uh, the New International Version of the Bible, for example, with the original document. You put them side by side, and you notice that the difference is just enormous. So let's 
let's look at some examples. Let's look, for example, at uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And there we read that the earth was formless and empty. Now, if you go back to the original, which is written in, in Hebrew, we find that the word tohu means destroyed, not formless. Next, the word bohu means vague ruins, not empty. So we're not reading there that the earth was formless and empty. Instead, we read that the earth was destroyed and in vague ruins. Now, that changes the entire picture, doesn't it? Exactly, yes. It's a huge difference. So that's just one verse. Go through the entire thing, and, you know, it's shocking what you find. Now, let's add to that. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. And there it says that, I saw the earth, and it was formless and empty. Well, it's the same words. I saw the earth, and it was destroyed and in vague ruins, and the heavens had no light. Now, so far, everything sounds just like Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it? Yes. But now here comes, here comes the kicker. Next it says, I saw the mountains, and they trembled, um, and all the hills moved swiftly. Now, it says, I saw there was no man left, and all the birds of the heavens were gone. I saw that the fruitful places were uninhabitable, uninhabitable, and all its cities were destroyed. What? Mm. You mean there were men, birds, fruits, cities before the first day of creation? Interesting. This is, this is really remarkable. Now let's take a one other step forward. Let's take a look at the six days of creation. Let's analyze that for a little bit. So we have the Hebrew word Ireb and Bokeh. Now, those two words stand for evening to morning. So we have read that it was the evening and the morning of the first day or the evening and the morning of the third day. That's a 12-hour night period. It's not a 24-hour day. That's the first catch. The second thing is that this phrase of Ereb and Boker is used only two other times in the entire Bible. Uh, Genesis 1, of course, is one place. Now, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 2, and Daniel chapter 8, right around verse 16, are the, the only two other places. The Leviticus section talks about what's called Beshashamem. Beshash Mem is a night vigil dedicated to, listen carefully, desolation, transgression, and horrific devastation. Hmm. Now think back to, I saw the earth and it was destroyed in a vague ruin, ruins. Again, the words Ereb and Boker are being used here. Now we wonder what devastation is it talking about? Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. The 2300-day prophecy also talks of Ereb and Boker. Those are not 2300 days. Those are 2300 evenings and mornings. Same place, same meaning of destruction. Now, if you multiply 360 years, which is the 12 hours between evening and morning, times 30 days per month, Multiply that by the prophetic number of days, which is 2,300. You come up with an age for this destruction, which would have been right around the year 73,216 B.C. In other words, when Lemuria was destroyed. Now that's yes. fascinating. Now, Genesis chapter 1-2 then is pointing towards Lemuria, but then after what happens in the flood, the flood then is talking about Atlantis. And there's a lot more information about that that I can eventually get into. Well, and but, we've got a couple of questions on that. So it all sort of flows in. And what I'm picking up, and we've talked about this before, and you said that in the beginning, 
because somebody says something doesn't make it true. You've got the scientific background. Obviously, you've done your homework and really studied this uh, on a number of levels to come up with the, the conclusions we're talking about on the program today. And all of this is in uh, both Legacy as well as my website. All of the references are there, all of the computations. Uh, this is basic Hebrew. This is not rocket science. It's very simple. All you have to do is go to the original and read it in the original language. And then the entire picture of everything, all of these historical events, uh, it takes a whole, whole new dimension, meaning uh, facts. It's all different. And it really puts the importance on translation, doesn't it? If you're, yes. you're loose in your translation because there's an outcome you want to arrive at, that really taints what happened. And not only that, we also have to be aware, as I mentioned previously, you have to be aware of the meaning of certain words in those traditions. Right. I'll give you, give you an example. Uh, and I talked about the word faith in a previous program where you have emunah in Hebrew and you have pistis in Greek. Uh, and, and like I said, I could spend hours on this stuff, but pistis, the, the Greek word for faith, that's the name of a Greek goddess. So the meaning of faith in the New Testament was taken more so for the values of this goddess than the actual meaning of faith biblical, biblically. So it's not faith in the New Testament, it's trust. Faith is a totally different thing. And this could be a whole other conversation, but again, it's in Legacy Explained, and it's also on the website. Legacy series by Robert Maxim, our guest on the program. That's M-A-X-X-I-M. The book is available, of course, at Amazon, at all Barnes & Noble, all the places. You can go to Robert's website, which is rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N.com, to get information what Robert was talking about and all of his very well laid out. He doesn't say anything unless he can back it up because he was a skeptic in the beginning and went through and, and laid out, to, did all the groundwork for you. And if you go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, you can link on directly to, uh, to Robert's website and get information. So the sources are legacy, and keep in mind what you're reading, basically a, an autobiography that Robert has put together in an amazing story form. And at the website, you've got great information broken down so you can understand it and uh, present it in a very scientifically validated way. Mention Lemuria and Atlantis and a couple of questions, yes. and we, we focused on that a couple of programs ago. Mm -hmm. Did they really exist, and what lessons can we learn from the two? First of all, mm -hmm. did they really exist, and we've already talked that, that they have, but you can answer that, and then what do, what do we learn from these two? Oh, unquestionably, it's no fantasy, and Legacy's narrative has tons, tons of evidence to back it up. I just mentioned a few from the Bible itself, uh, but there's also evidence which is genetic, there, there are historical accounts, uh, it's all outlined in Legacy and briefly also on my website. Now, while you are there, uh, I encourage the listener to view the Atlantis Lemuria video, which is on the first page of the website. But then also go to the References menu tab and select Earth's Age. You will see a lot of what I just described there, as well as the evidence for the existence of of Atlantis and Lemuria. Under Atlantis alone, there are 20 historical references. And those references go back all the way to about 4000 BC. Uh, and you have not just uh, small documents uh, that are talking about it, entire civilizations from India to Egypt, etc. Uh, famous people like Plato, um, Strabo, uh, they talk about it. This is not just Plato. Hmm. So I highly encourage the reader to go and check it out. Now, regarding, regarding uh, Lemuria, here's something very interesting. Every one of us has, uh, has inner genes, uh, what's known as the, as the uh, mitochondria. And that is a record kind of like the skins of an onion uh, or tree ring. So tree ring is added every year. Uh, as the tree leaves, lives, and at every generation 
adds an extra layer to the mitochondrial DNA. So if you count all of these layers, one after the other one, at the rate of generations, for example, uh, until you get down to ground zero, you come up with what's called the YMRCA, or the most recent common ancestor. Now, as you look at this mitochondrial setup, and as you remove these layers, you come up against a particular section. And that section shows what's called the great bottleneck. Now, this bottleneck occurred right around 75,000 BC. Start connecting the dots, if you will, please. Yep, I've heard that before. Okay, so 75,000 BC, you have this huge dip. And what the dip means is that in order to come up with those mitochondrial um, combinations, you had on Earth no more than 1,000 breeding pairs left. Now, what does that mean? If there were billions of people on this planet and it came down to maybe two or 3,000 left, what happened in the planet? What kind of destruction, big ruins, devastation happened that is even noted in the Bible? But don't stop there. Humans are not the only ones that have that, uh, that mitochondrial bottleneck. Animals have it. Uh, fish have it. Everything that lives today that lived back then also has that dip. So it's not just a mistake in human genetics. It's worldwide. It's just uh, amazing. I'm, <laughs> I'm absorbing everything. If you hear where the host is like a little slow in responding, I'm like in sponge form now. I, I'm absorbing all of this and tying into what we talked about in the uh, initial question about uh, the Bible, historical events. Robert Gayton or Robert Maxim, our guest on the program, M-A-X-X-I-M. The website is rgayton, G-A-E-T-A-N.com. Legacy Series is what we're talking about. Great information at the website. If you can't remember all of that, just go to thisweekinamerica.us and link on directly to Robert's website and get all of the information. We're going through listener viewer questions that have come in over the, the last few months. We've got a backlog here. We're trying to, in an expanded program today, get through as many as we can. And this one is interesting. I have, uh, I have experiences where I feel like I've been there before, even meet people uh -huh. who seem familiar, but I'm meeting them for the first time. I have no visions. Do these experiences mean anything? Oh, Rick, that is just, you know, that is just fantastic. Now we're talking. That's exciting. And that's. Well, yeah, and a lot of people go through that. It's interesting. Yeah. Somebody will say, boy, you look familiar. Where do I know you from? And it's like, I've never seen you, uh, dude, in my life. This is the first time we've ever met. So this is something that I think a lot of people have gone through or they find themselves in a, in a room or a building or traveling. And it's like, man, this seems, seems familiar. Didn't mean to uh, interrupt it. It's something it's we can great. all relate to. Explain yeah. the question is, what does this mean? Well, th what it means is that this is the norm. Remember a couple of shows back, I mentioned uh, how beings of other worlds live uh, with a certain awareness, and that's the norm for normal human beings, and we were the abnormal? Well, what they feel is the norm. Those feelings are, believe it or not, visions. Yes, they're having visions. That bit of awareness can go such a long way if we objectify them. Uh, if we didn't just say, well, you know, maybe it's happened, says no, take the opportunity, objectify, objectify, objectify. Perhaps the immediate places and the people are not the actual ones from the past, but they do provide similarity to an actual past event. Uh, for example, let's say that you're at a beach and you're afraid of going into the water. Now, perhaps the, 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 you as an individual perished in a beach, uh, uh, maybe you drowned at the shore, you know, but it was not necessarily that one beach, but that beach helped bring that memory to the fore. And so maybe the, the color of the clothing, uh, the expression of the face, maybe did something, the background, uh, the sun, the smells, something clued you in. And it could also have been that very individual, too. There is just so many things that you have to objectify. You have to learn to be dead honest with yourself as to what was it that triggered it? What was it? 
I tell you, in the beginning, is not may not be easy because we're not used to it. We have we have taught ourselves to ignore those little clues. But after a while, uh, especially after doing what Dr. Ernest Norman suggested once, that you keep a log of the good things and the bad things that happen to you during the day. Keep a log. Keep a log. That helps you. That helps teach you how to remember how to objectify and put the right information into the right subject. So many people will listen and go, wow, I wish I could do that. He has visions. He's, he's seen these, these lands that we're talking about and had these experiences. What you're talking about, is this something we all share or is it a select few that fall into that category that, uh, that, that, have, that have been reincarnated? We all share it. But uh, I include myself as one of those that was, you know, putting on the blinders. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. This is what's real. This is not real. Right. So, of course, I wasn't seeing it. But once I went through those experiences where I learned to objectify and I, and I learned stop looking there, start looking at what you're blinding yourself, everything just changed. Now, I'm going to jump ahead. A question that we had set up for a couple questions from now, but ties right in. How can I share my experiences with other like-minded individuals? And how do you handle the skeptics? If you feel Ooh. like, okay, I've been here before. I know that I've been here before. How do you find out if that's true? And if you're talking to someone that says, are, what are you smoking? I mean, that, that's, that, that can't be the case. You're, you're here now. You weren't here in the French Revolution. You're here now. The first part of that question, how do you, how do you share it with people that will, that will nurture the feelings that you have? Well, uh, Jesus one time said, don't throw pearls in front of pigs. Because they won't know that they're pearls and treat them uh, with care and give them value. They would just eat them. They think it's food. So we have to be careful of our audience. Now, uh, to answer, I guess, that question, I have to say that I must know and I must be myself at all times. No hypocrisy, just pure honesty. Now, that means that I must share experiences first with, with me. I have to overcome negation so that I can be clear and, and honest. And only then can I share with those that ask. But even when they ask, I have to be very careful that what I'm going to share with them will be of value to them. I'm not calling them pigs, but, <laughs> uh, and I'm not calling what I have to say pearls, but we always have to be careful who the message is intended for. Okay. Now, before talking, of course, we have to objectify why we want to say what we want to say. Because sometimes it's the ego that wants to show off, hey, I had a vision, I'm somebody. You know, we have to watch out for that. We're not here to teach or to convert people. We're only here to learn and to get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. <laughs> And of course, Rick, I, I hear from skeptics all the time. I hear horrific things. And, you know, uh, I have pity. I, I have sympathy for them. They, they have every right to believe and say what they will. If they want to strike me, they have the right to do that too. It's part of their learning experience. Uh, those that aim to hurt, to defy, and to stick out egotistically among the crowd they're only hurting themselves. And like I said, I have much sympathy and love for them. So if you have skeptics, love them. It's the best thing that you can do for them. If you're trying to help people, also help skeptics. Like Jesus said, there's no value in helping people to love you. Love those that hate you. That's where the challenge is. That's what really proves whether you, you do love or not. That's what separates the boys from the men or, or the young girls from, from the ladies. Right. But, you know, sometimes people do have it coming for, for treading a little too fast or too hard. Yes. Uh, after all, Jesus did go into the temple and overturn tables and whip some people. So sometimes it comes to that. Well, what was it like as you were growing up? As a, as a child, you, you had the visions with, 
with children, your, your, your peers that you were growing up with, with, with family members as you were expressing what you were, what you were going through, was that a difficult time for you? Oh, it was horrible. Uh, I can tell you that my parents, they, uh, they didn't support me at all. They thought I was a nutcase. Uh, my friends, my teachers, uh, everybody. It was uh, the world against, against me. So it, it, was, it was sad growing up, you know. It was very lonesome. I never got a date, that's for sure. Uh, it, probably that was, that was the best part, that I never had a date. <laughs> <laughs> Were there periods when you went through that that you began to doubt yourself if what you thought you had experienced, you actually experienced? I was reliving. I was reliving. Uh, opening up my mouth at the wrong time. No. Yeah. Uh, and I can say that um, talking to a brick wall and being forceful about it can sometimes have undue things happen to you. And I can I, I have seen that in the last 2000 years, uh, I have not been treated very kindly for having uh an uncontrollable mouth and saying all that is wrong and all of this is wrong and all of this is wrong. Uh, yes, I have been, I have been put under. I have been burnt. I have, a lot of things have been done to me. Um, so, this rejection of this life was nothing more than a repeat. And, but fortunately, uh, I guess I had learned enough to kind of soak it in now, and not really fight back. Um, so I've, these things that happened to me happened for a reason, uh, happened as a lesson. And I, I guess I've learned some lessons, and now I'm treading in a whole different style. It's not wise. It's not wise to approach people and tell them that they're wrong. And I did that long enough in previous lives, and I started the same path this life as well. But fortunately, I got the message finally, learned the lesson, and uh, stopped throwing pearls before pigs. <laughs> Robert Maxim, our guest on the program. The Legacy Series is his story. It's available at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the usual places. Information at his website, rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N.com. Like I'm by going directly to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. An expanded program that isn't going to be nearly long enough to get all the questions in. Here's another mm -hmm. one. It's sort of similar to the question that, that we just had. I feel uh -huh. attached to a certain period of history. Many people hmm. will say that, that they're drawn to the Civil War, the French Revolution, or whatever. I enjoy mm -hmm. reading books of that time period, occasionally do some research. Is it possible oh. I once lived in ah. that time period? So if you ah. have an affinity for a certain, uh, a certain period of time... Mm -hmm. Uh, does that mean that maybe we were there once? Well, um, mon frère Rick, vive la France. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely, yes. You see, this is how we begin to objectify. No detail is too small. Leave no thought unturned. You will be drawn to what you have experiences with. It's great to see people that have this awareness. I just love it. I love it. But... We must be aware of many pitfalls along the way. That is, it's the lessons and the feelings and the emotions that we want to decipher, the inclinations that we have that lead us sometimes to the wrong thing. Uh, finding the actual historical personage is not of that much importance. It's what you are that's important. Uh, for example, uh, since I was a child, uh, I've been listening to these symphonies and songs in my head from the classical period. I would have a dream, I would hear it, and I would come back and I would write it. You know, all three parts of the symphony with every instrument. So uh, I never knew where that was coming from. And of course, it's not good to use conscious mind. It's just the emotions that are important. Well, as I was uh, writing Legacy Episode 3, which, by the way, I'm going to publish in a couple of months here. Oh, great. Uh, I was talking with May Lynn in the story, and all of a sudden, she said, by the way, you were Giuseppe Valentini. And I go, what? Uh, I wrote it down, and I was going to erase it. I said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to say that. I'm not sure. Blah, blah, blah. But then something said, give it a chance. 
give it a chance. So I kept it in the book and I started looking for Giuseppe Valentini. The guy was so rarely known, I couldn't find him. But mm. eventually I found Giuseppe Valentini and I found who his teacher was. Um, and I wrote it down. I didn't think much of it. Two years later, Rick, I have a dream where I am in a conservatory and I'm a child. I am Giuseppe Valentini and I'm playing in a harpsichord. I am kind of a leading forward thinker and I am playing things that are more extreme classical. And my teacher, who I forget who, who, who it was, basically takes my hands off the keyboard, slowly puts them in my lap silently goes to the keyboard plays what i was supposed to play gives me a nod and telling me this is why you're in the conservatory if you want to be here this is what you play giuseppe <laughs> <laughs> okay and then i said okay that confirms it that was it that, yes and and what i was playing is what i ended up composing so now everything checked in so um i I'm not after names. I'm not after saying, well, I was so-and-so. It, it's what I have done. The lessons I have learned, that's what's important. Uh, I am no longer that individual. Uh, I am a mirror image, a reincarnated instance of several lifetimes. And I have, I have no interest of giving myself a name, saying that I'm Napoleon or whatever. I'll say, oh, goodness, maybe not that one, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, but you know, you get my drift. It's what exactly, I yes. feel, what I what I represent, how I serve the infinite, how I serve the elements, how I serve humanity. That is where I want to go. I don't want to hang on to this rope that's going down into the absorption cycle, trying to, trying to say to everybody, "Hey, I was somebody." You know, that's not why we're here. We're here to let go. We're not here to grab on. Robert Maxim, our guest on the program, Legacy Series, his work, you'll find it at his website, rgayton.com. Uh, available, of course, at Amazon and Barnes & Noble and by linking on directly at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. A question that's interesting because you've talked about this a number of times. The, the, the listener says, you said in the show in the past that you've had to make up for past bad behavior. What behavior and how were you instructed to atone and how did your life change after that? Interesting question. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, the past is always a lesson to the present. You know, there's no such thing as good or bad. It's where you judge and put the finger. That's what applies to you. So even, even those things uh, that happen in this lifetime are things I have to be dealt with. Uh, atonement is achieved by carrying out the, mis the mission that we came here to do, to recognize tendencies, habits, thoughts, and then denying them space in our mind and applying positive endeavor. Being objective and recognition is the key to emancipation. But things like guilt, fear, condemnation, um, making offering to gods, none of that. That has no value. It does nothing for you. You have to change yourself. There's nothing that will do it for you. There's no punishment in evolution other than what you give to yourself. It's only awareness that matters because it's you and you alone that must live with you. It's all in your soul and it's going nowhere until you see, understand, and overcome what in the way you are. You must want to do it from the heart not from fear or for, from obligation. It's because you feel it. If not, then you're going to repeat the grade again. You'll come back next time. You'll be the same thing, if not worse. Because every time you come back, you regenerate that negation. A child is never punished for failing a question on a test, but rather is encouraged to seek exactly the reasons why he failed, why he is, and what he is. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. And it's a great answer to the question. Another uh, listener writes in, are you forced to do anything against your own will? When we talk about mm -hmm. visions, we talk about visits. Uh, I, I guess the question comes up. Are there times when 
you're instructed, you're asked to do something, uh, and you don't want to do it. <laughs> oh, boy. How many hours do we have again? <laughs> <laughs> well, what to do, what to believe, fear, or hate, convert, teach. Oh, yes, indeed. All those temptations are out there all the time. Uh, we are in a dimension where we're showered, bombarded by these things. That's what the negative forces do. But the process, the progressive infinite is not that way at all. Evolution is all about free choice, learning, non-interference. That's a way of life on all higher positive worlds. But one thing that I must mention is that some, well, everyone comes to this world with a mission. Uh, of course, I have my mission. And if my higher self says that I must see this to learn it, I must do this to learn it, why I became a musician, why I became a scientist, uh, these were things that I prearranged before being born so I could go through these experiences and figure this stuff out. When I had my Alpha Centauri, uh, vision the brothers told me don't forget 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 and at the end they said share this with the world this is our message well it, i was not being forced i realized that they were reminding me not telling me reminding me of a mission i had accepted before being born in this life so even though I heard, remember and say this, it was something that I had agreed before being born where I said, I will remember and I will say this. If you There's have, difference. yes, and it's interesting you make that distinction. If you have questions for Robert, you can go to the, uh, the website thisweekinamerica.us and uh, simply submit the question for, uh, for a future program. And you go to uh, Robert's website, rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N dot com, and you can uh, get information and, and do the same there. The next question we've answered as a child, how did you realize what was happening? Who did you talk to? How were your parents and friends reacted? And you've discussed that. Uh, maybe the yeah. first part of that, when did you realize something was happening? And, and, and let's just talk about that briefly. You've, you've answered the others. When did you realize this is not normal, this is not just a dream, something actually happened to me? Was there a point when you realized something special was happening? July of 1973. That was when you realized, okay, this is, this is for real. This is not a normal, a normal dream. Correct. That's when it happened. And that's when I realized that many previous dreams, Rick, were kind of like preparatory stages. Yeah, I don't think right. I've really mentioned that. But through the years, I'd had a lot of experience, dream-like experiences that were very, kind of vague. But they had been preparing me for this other big reality show <laughs> that exactly. I experienced. Well, uh -huh. I, I knew that uh, when we're talking about July 13th, 1973, that we've used that date and we've talked about that. I didn't know when that was the first realization hit you that, okay, this, this is what this is, or whether that's you were having these vague dreams and you didn't understand, but that's when it really hit you. You formulated this, okay, now I know what's going on. I, the rest of that question we've answered earlier, but uh, horrific, I think, is how you described your, your life and childhood and growing up, so that, that pretty well sums it up. Uh, question, are there members of the scientific community who share your views? Uh, some do, some don't. I'm actually working with some Peruvian scientists now uh, who have a keen interest in what's going on. Uh, but from the onset, science has disagreed with me publicly, but agreed with me in private. I wonder now why. that's interesting. That's yeah, interesting. go figure. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Now, I've exposed both the good and the not-so-good side of science uh, at times, being able to prove things logically in a positive, constructive way with deflector shields down. But this, you know, that's not always positive, depending who you're talking to, the ego that you're dealing with, uh, the survival instinct of the other person. Some people can just be as hard as a rock sometimes. But 
Science is getting to an understanding of creation, and amp theory and string theory are just the beginning of this, uh, which is, you know, it's great. Uh, I love what they're beginning to conceive, but uh, the first thing, science has to abandon what I call the three don'ts, which are solace, time, and space. Uh, have to replace that with the fact that everything is composed of infinite, intelligent energy and every waveform, every frequency, every spark of energy in our souls, body, thoughts, ideas, atoms, a uh, uh, glass of water that I'm drinking here on the side, all of that is intelligent, infinite, creative energy that comes from the fountainhead of creation itself. It is intelligent. It has a purpose. You put them together and you get the stuff. Uh, and it's not because uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, mix to create water. The purpose for that is so much higher, so, so much more intelligent. We can't conceive it. We can't measure it. We have to get out of this uh, solid time space uh, continuum that we're in. We have to start going beyond it. When we do, then we're going to begin to see where all of this stuff is coming from and how it works. Robert Maxim, our guest on the program, Legacy Series. We have a few minutes left in the program. We did an expanded show. We're going to have to do uh, a couple more of these to get through these questions. And we certainly invite you to submit new questions. And this one is interesting. And let me ask the way it was submitted, and then we'll go back and, and, and take it part by part. Why have you been selected and what is expected of you? And from what you've said in past programs and in the, the program today before we got here, is selected the right word? Have you been selected for anything or you are just attuned to what's happening? Well, over, over the lifetimes, I've worked for it. Uh, I was not chosen, but rather it was I that chose to follow uh, infinite law, Interesting. which is the normal out there in the universe. But uh, I can say that it took me long enough Uh the uh, we all have the opportunity to participate in infinity we all are invited but few respond it's like the uh, jesus's story of the maidens with the uh, oil lamps you know many are invited but how many actually come yes yes yeah interesting and are there expectations that you feel that uh, maybe you need to be doing more uh, Explain that. I, I, I'm very yes. articulate in, in asking that. But are the are there expectations that come? Maybe the expectations are the ones that do self-imposed. Yeah, I try to keep my antenna up uh, for any expectation of things to do. Uh, I certainly am doing a lot of work with uh, Unaris United site and Dr. Norman's work. Uh, I feel that I have a lot to bring to the world by having that preserved and showcased in its true light. Uh, but there are many other things that I'm doing. Uh, legacy, the movie that's coming up, uh, lessons that I received. I just received a great lesson, uh, which is uh, why, uh, how the Earth is actually creating the um, um, global warming effect, uh, how the, the Earth's fields are actually acting like a radio uh, retuned by nuclear energy to receive different bands of energy which actually are beginning to heat the planet so that's all on the website and i highly encourage listeners to go have a peek it's interesting stuff it is interesting stuff and we'll close the program by by talking about the website rgaetan.com i i follow you on facebook how can people follow you on facebook because yeah i what you've talked about with climate change and other scientific uh, topics that you address are, are, are fascinating. How do they follow you on Facebook? Well, uh, I encourage people then to go to my website and in the uh, contact and about section, I have links to the Facebook page where they can click there. Uh, they can uh, send me emails if they would like, and I can get into uh, more detail on specific things. Um, I certainly would like people to also participate in my movie making experience. So I always love feedback from people who have ideas and um, I've had some people do that. And of course, I'll go ahead and put their their ideas into the movie as well. 
All that information at uh, Robert's website, rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N.com. A lot of the areas that we talked about, you'll also find online at unariusunited.com. And, of course, you can go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and link on directly to Robert's website. Still some questions to go from listeners, but doesn't mean we don't want your questions, because we do. So go to uh, Robert's website, go to our website, submit the questions. We'll be happy to talk about them on the program. Robert, we covered a lot of ground during the program today, got through uh, quite a few of these, still have more to go, but we've got through quite a few of these. Thank you once again for, uh, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, my pleasure, Rick. Thank you. It is always fun and enlightening. Robert Maxim, our guest on the program, M-A-X-X-I-M, talking about the Legacy Series. Information available at Robert's website, our Gaten, G-A-E-T-A-N, R, then G-A-E-T-A-N.com. And, of course, you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We are back after these messages. <laughs> 